the reason I began writing about failure was I was invited to be part of a um, set of performances that were being curated by a, an art group. This was back in 2004, and the art group was called LTTR, and that can stand for any number of things, but at the time they were calling themselves Lesbians to the Rescue, and they curated an evening called Practice More Failure. Practice More Failure. And this was in 2004, so it was uh, during the uh, Bush regime, and uh, all the emphasis in the US was on making money, uh, going to war, uh, being the world superpower. Uh, it was a very sort of nationalistic moment. There was also the Olympic Games was on, and the TV was full of American athletes winning all the time. So at this event and in my presentation, I argued that failure was a, an anti-nationalist uh, discourse in an era of the superpower. My book is called The Queer Art of Failure, and it, uh, may, it, it focuses upon the way in which queer people uh, willingly and regularly almost choose to fail. Rather than succeed within the terms that the society has set up, i.e. reproductive futurity, or um, being a productive person, or making lots of money, uh, failure can uh, basically be a performance of dissent and refusal. And I, base, I sketched out the way in which this was a queer category. In this, I shared with a lot of other theorists at the time who were writing about failure. Uh, the, probably the most important person writing about failure was Jose Munoz, who writes about queer failure in his book, Cruising Utopia. And he, in his archive, there are all of these artists who were in the scene around the time of Andy Warhol in New York, but were in relation to Warhol as failures. So Jack Smith, for example, was a very eccentric artist who would invite people over to his loft for a performance and then never show up. Um, he would create these sort of fantastical worlds, um, but he was always uh, on the very margins of even the art worlds that he was a part of. So um, there was a, I went, it's not an idealization or a romanticization of failure so much as a recognition that the terms success and failure have a lot of political content and critique embedded within them. Someone like Lee Edelman uh, is in a way writing around some of the same issues, but he's a very strict psychoanalytic Lacanian critic, uh, and therefore he would argue that homosexuality is a, is a position rather than a, an identity, a position in the, within a social structure that is set up to fail. And rather than uh, having a homosexual population who are desperately trying to get out of this category of failure and enter into the category of success, he argues for embracing failure, as do I. But for him, failure is structural rather than political, um, and there isn't any particular politics that follows from this kind of negativity. Um, Leo Bassani, I think, is an another interesting voice just because long before anyone else, he pointed to the fact that when we say the gay community, we're really creating a complete fiction of unanimity and uniformity and that there's nothing really that unites gay people. And furthermore, there's nothing necessarily that orients gay people to progressive or radical politics. And while there's a, something of a conservative bent to Bassani's work, at the same time, he allows for other people to do the work of saying why queer, what's radical about queerness, what's queer about radical politics, rather than presuming that gays and lesbians are, because of who they are, uh, uh, certain kinds of political subjects. So, you know, my work is very deliberately setting out to name a subject position, a political agenda, uh, and a form of critique that is uh, radically dissenting 
grounded in refusal, and explicitly queer. One of my frustrations with a lot of academic theory is that it uses the same five philosoph philosophical traditions and philosophical currents over and over again. Um, and for me, that limits what can be said. Um, given that, you know, in any given moment, there are so many people writing, and there are so many people writing amazing things. And given that we don't really any longer believe in canons of thought really strictly, it seemed to me that in a book on failure, you would want to push against the conventional and orthodox wisdom uh, around lineages of thought. So um, in my introduction, I craft something, or I, I argue on behalf of something called low theory. And low theory is opposed to high theory. And it takes as its archive um, much of the popular culture texts that most avant-garde and queer writers will reject. So someone like Bassani, someone like Edelman, they're always going to go to Genet, Hitchcock, uh, um, I, I don't know, Gide. I mean, it's going to be always gay male writers, usually French, uh, who we can easily recognize within um, high modernist traditions. So my archive is deliberately an archive that seems not to have anything to say politically. However, the archive that I chose for this book was new animated feature films uh, for children. And this is because uh, one of the things that we do in, in um, capitalist cultures is we contain rebellion by casting it as childish. So we say, you know, certain forms of rebellion are just seen as being incredibly immature. And so children's films are loaded with these scenes of rebellion and uh, almost revolutionary impulse because it's seen as being a safe genre for the expression of revolutionary desire. Because it's directed to children, it casts revolutionary desire as any way immature, premature, uh, childish, and infantile. Um, and it, there's a kind of confidence that there is no political subject who will emerge from watching those films. So what I noticed in watching the Pixar movies, for example, is that they have um, oddly socialist themes to them. Um, they tend to involve groups of animals that rise up together against oppressive or exploitative masters. And one of the first Pixar films, A Bug's Life, just as an example, were a group of ants that, whose food every winter was stolen by grasshoppers, who were fewer in number but bigger in size. And uh, so the ants decide that one day, that even though they're small, they're many, and the many can overcome the few. So you, this is the beginning of, uh, uh, in Disney at any rate, in Pixar, uh, an emphasis on social insects and the many against the few. So instead of, in, in lots of uh, conventional films that are geared more towards adults, the emphasis is always on the individual, the individual love story, the individual tragedy, the individual within an adventure frame. But in children's films, the emphasis is always on the group. And this is also partly because children themselves are often in groups, they're not individuated in the same way. Um, and all of this adds up to this really crazy situation where you find incredibly radical stories being played out on the big screen for kids. And so I wanted to investigate that. And uh, the other thing that you have to do in a children's film is not focus too much on success because the lessons that parents want to teach their kids is it's okay to fa fail, try and try again, you know. Uh, and if everything was geared towards success, you'd end up with a lot of very neurotic children. So children's materials are archives of failure, awkwardness, clumsiness, um, failure, uh, um, the, the, and also a kind of strength and collectivity. So that theme sort of runs through the book, saying that in failure, you can access other forms of being in relationship to others uh, on behalf of a different political agenda.
in the last 10 years uh, in gay activist groups around the world, gay marriage has come to stand for the uh, activist goals of these movements. Um, and this is actually really odd because if you go back to the 1970s, uh, the Gay Liberation Front in the US and various radical gay movements in other countries, uh, going all the way back to the 20s in Germany, for example, the goal was never to simply blend into the society. The goal was to transform the society, as it was for many social movements coming out of the 60s and the 70s. So when we arrive in the 21st century, where we have winnowed down all of our political goals to this one thing, which is we want, apparently, to have this normal framework for our relationships that, by the way, doesn't work anyway for heterosexual people because divorce is now 60% of all marriages end in divorce, which means that most marriages end in divorce. So at the very moment that divorce becomes a cultural dominant, marriage no longer works, and there's a really deep desire for other forms of social intimacy, gays and lesbians decide that they want to get married. To me, this is a complete and utter selling out of the really radical visions uh, from the 70s. Um, and you know, one of what I say about kids in particular is that there's a presumption in raising children that those children are straight, right? But the truth is, and this is something that Catherine Bond Stockton argues in her book on the queer child, every child is queer in some way because b babies aren't born heterosexual. Like a child isn't born anything. They are born a bundle of sexual potentials. And what we need to do instead of now orienting gays and lesbians also towards this future where your whole world gets narrowed down to the couple form and then again to the family form and reproduction is the be all and end all of existence, right? Instead of now recruiting gays and lesbians to that same tired, boring scenario that anyway everyone else seems to be completely tired of, um, we should be trying to figure out how to raise children to have bigger and better horizons of possibility. And that's where the queer uh, art of failure comes in and the Gaga feminism book that I wrote. And one of the claims I make in Gaga Feminism is that children anyway are not romantically oriented. Their sexuality for a very long time is autoerotic, it's not other oriented, so they're not in the couple form. They're often rebellious within the family form. Um, and it's we who train them to want only one thing. So instead of spending all of this social energy demanding that children reproduce the world that we have fucked up, you know, this messed up world that we can barely live in anymore. Why would we train more generations to do the same lunacy, you know, create the same lunacy? So I'm, Gaga Feminism is a, a plea to a, allow for, you know, a thousand flowers to bloom, to allow people to follow their own paths rather than demanding, training, and insisting upon domestic heterosexuality which has proven to be a completely uh, ruined form, social form. So the wild uh, is a, a term again that um, came about when people like myself and Jose Munoz and, and another scholar at NYU, Tavia Nyong'o, began to feel that the word queer was exhausted uh, that we were making it do too much work critically and conceptually. And that when queerness is just like an umbrella for everyone who wants to get married, then you have to move on to a new term. So the wild is that exactly what I was just talking about in terms of unpredictability, uh, chance, that you don't know what your child will be like when they grow up. Just as you don't know what profession they have, you probably shouldn't know what form their social intimacies will take. Maybe they'll have many friends and date many people. Maybe they'll be single their whole life. Maybe they'll join a commune. But the, the idea that we already know in advance exactly how their life will play out after the age of 23 tames the wild potential of human existence and human complexity. So the question asked by that category, the wild, is whether we can return human life forms to not simply to a more eco-friendly eco form of coexistence with other life forms on the planet, but also 
reproduce the terms under which unpredictability can thrive. In my experience, summer schools are great, uh, great, great places for young people, young intellectuals, to uh, create a really diverse peer group, um, work and learn with people who otherwise they would never come into contact with from other universities, um, and extend their studies in ways that take them out of the humdrum academic routine of, you know, uh, getting a degree. Like you're not worrying all the time here about whether this is going to count towards your final grade. People are actually here to think. And I find that these intense sessions, such as the sessions that we have here in um, Belgrade, are really um, conducive to people changing course. So even over the last two days, lots of the students while presenting their work have said that, you know, they came in with one project but they're already rethinking it. That's what you want. You don't want students to come in with a project, sit down, and simply carry out that project. You want the impact of these conversations with the professors and with the other students, and the conversation that they have with a new city as well, to completely transform how they're thinking about the work that they're doing otherwise in a very uniform way.